Good morning, everybody. Welcome uh, to the second day of the conference. Uh, Mr. Maki told me that you don't mind if I say again, Bismillah ar-Rahman al-Rahim, to begin the morning uh, appropriately. First of all, I would like to thank Dubai Customs for the fantastic gala dinner. I think uh, it was really amazing, uh, the singer and also the dancers. Uh, and the performance, um, I'm sure you have heard in the meantime, they've been brought in, uh, like the singer was from Oman, uh, and the dancers uh, with the um, electronic uh, features were imported from Japan, uh, while of course the traditional dancers came from here. It was very interesting to see because it's a long-standing tradition. And I'm sure we will all take back uh, good memories, uh, also memories of good discussions, uh, memories of what we've seen uh, in the cultural village, uh, or memories like this one um, that will fade away, but this is the case with all memories, unfortunately, and we have therefore to keep them in our heart and in our mind. Thank you. Uh, yesterday, after the VIP opening, I think we got an insight in how different stakeholders from different regions, also from different uh, developing stages, uh, see the current challenges. I, I thought we saw consensus that collaborative efforts are needed to ensure supply chain efficiency, security, and facilitation. Uh, we heard about the four Cs. Uh, we heard about data sharing and also the use of technology uh, that have to be part of this collaborative effort. While Customs has uh, the World Customs Organization forum, it seems more difficult to interact with other agencies, uh, be it at a national level uh, or cross borders. Um, so there probably uh, we have to undertake more efforts. Let's see, uh, maybe we get some more replies uh, to the squaring the circle question uh, today and tomorrow. I was asked to say also uh, that uh, please uh, leave the headphones uh, on the tables, don't take them out or don't take them uh, somewhere else. Because some have already got missing, uh, they must be displaced. Uh, maybe someone took them um, to the chairs outside. So please leave them where they are. Otherwise, uh, it's difficult um, to ensure that everybody gets a headphone. Today, we will have a very uh, mixed uh, session, uh, or type of sessions, different sessions. We will have round table and panel this morning, as well as keynote speeches. And in the afternoon, we will have something new, the knowledge commons, uh, which are during lunchtime in English only, uh, in the exhibition hall. and. The Knowledge Commons are followed by the Tech Talks, uh, where we have three streams with different interpretation, interpretation channels, Arabic, Spanish, and French, uh, depending on the Tech Talk. Now I would suggest uh, let's get started. Um, the, the opening address for today will be given by Mr. Brian Moore, Global Managing Director of Accenture's Public Service Operations and Management Industry. He leads a global team of dedicated professionals with ex expertise in diverse industries, such as postal, which nowadays uh, with uh, security concerns uh, and facilitation is very important. Revenue, still very important. Customs, of course, finance and public administration. I'd like to add also that Accenture is one of our oldest sponsors. Um, so maybe Mr. Moore, if I may ask you to come to the podium. Susanna, um, and, and certainly I'd like to reinforce what a, what a great event um, and say thank you to our hosts. Um, you know, yesterday was a great day. Uh, certainly dinner, dinner was lovely. And uh, a little bit more um, on myself as introduction, as uh, Susanna said, I'm a global managing director for uh, what one of our public service industries um, called operations and management really covers uh, central government 
and um, you know I'd emphasize the, the global point um, and, and our customs uh, business. Uh, you know we operate on a, a global basis, and it, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, what some of the trends we see um, around the world. So uh, certainly uh, recognize the, the WCO theme for 2013 uh, about innovation. And uh, this conference being about uh, coordinated border management. So what I'm going to talk about today is uh, a recently uh, produced report uh, from Accenture about our technology vision um, and how we see technology impacting the world uh, as we go forward. And I'll talk about that specific to uh, the customs, uh, the world of customs. Before I, uh, before I get into that, uh, I'll just give a brief introduction about uh, who we are. So uh, probably the key point uh, here, or one of the points, is that Accenture is a, a very large organization. As you can see, some of the points there, uh, we have more than 260,000 people. Uh, we work in more than 120 countries. So that, uh, that scale um, gives us uh, some benefits. Uh, one is that um, we can really focus uh, research on to specific industries. So um, in our business, what we do is focus on uh, specific areas, so customs being one of those, and uh, we really expend uh, a lot of resources uh, to bring our best to uh, the customs industry. Uh, so one of, the, um, one of the ways we look at, uh, at customs, we have a team, as, as Susanna mentioned, that uh, is focused exclusively on the customs business we work with clients around the world, and we're very operationally focused. Um, so, you know, we, I, I think one of the things I'm, I'm proud of is that we really understand the heart of the customs business, moving goods across the border, uh, the operational challenges go along with that. The other thing I'd mention is that when we look at public service, um, you know, our view of the overall public service landscape is that public service, um, area really has to change dramatically to prepare for the future. Uh, certainly we all know about uh, you know, many of the financial challenges that countries around the world have, uh, but as well, you know, expectations of citizens are very different today. Um, they're much more mobile. We're living in a globalized world. And you know, we believe for the most part the, the public sector models are, are kind of old um, and that we really need to reinvent how public sector works to prepare for the future. And we believe that really applies to the customs area as well. So let me get into our uh, technology vision a little bit. Uh, I think the, the number one point when we produced our technology vision, and this came out of our, our technology uh, research group, and it applies to all the industries we serve. So this is not specific to public sector or to customs. This is you know, really across uh, the vast uh, number of industries that we serve is that uh, technology has evolved to the point where it, it, it allows companies in virtually every industry to dramatically deliver more with less. Um, and, and I'll really emphasize the less. The cost of technology, the ease of use is, is just very different today than it was certainly five or 10 years ago. And so one of the big conclusions that came out of our research is that we believe every business in the world is fundamentally at this point uh, a technology business. And, and really what we like to say is that every business is a digital business. Um, I think many of us can see how that's happened in certain areas like media and entertainment where you know, they once delivered boxes with tapes or records or CDs in it and today it's all digital. Um, and those goods are moving across borders for sure. But the nature of that industry is you know, completely different in the course of 10 years. We believe we're at the beginning of a, a, a dramatic wave where that type of uh, impact is going to occur in, in almost all industries. And um, we identified seven trends uh, that we think every organization should consider. Uh, I don't think they apply certainly to every uh, industry, uh, but certainly when we look at customs, you know, we really would say that we believe the customs agency of the future is really a digital customs agency. There's three um, big points that, you know, from a technology point of view that I'd like to highlight. 
Um, and really, again, it, it, it comes back to this point of every customs agency needs to become a digital one. Uh, and the first point is around collaboration. Um, so you'll, you'll see the words here, seamless collaboration, but I'll put that into to really simple terms. This is about how customs agencies and in any organization can work with uh, partners, whether that's within the government or commercial traders or the actual consumers or uh, suppliers, man manufacturers or retailers. It's fundamentally different today than it's ever been in the past. It's much, much easier to do uh, and it's much lower cost. And that gives us the opportunity in this industry to do things in a, in a very new way. Uh, the second one is around uh, what we call design for analytics. So this isn't about analytics and analytics technology. This is about how we apply this in the business world, how we apply this in customs to get insight, to get information that allows us to operate more efficiently, to identify security threats, to identify uh, missed revenue. The third one is uh, what we call data velocity. I simply describe this as speed. Um, again, it's, 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 you know, somewhat similar to sort of the point around analytics, but the difference is, you know, speed. We can do things in real time today. We can process information, assess a threat, look for revenue leakage, and do all this in real time. We've never been really able to do that before. Uh, computing power is much cheaper. The technology can do this. We need to apply this um, into, into the customs operations. And so, you know, we sum all that up and we look at it and say, you know, we really have a burning platform in this industry to look at these three trends and determine how they affect every agency and really embrace these and build them into the processes, into the strategy of each customs organization around the world. I'll touch on each of these uh, for just a moment. When we talk about seamless collaboration, you know, first point I'd make is about maturity. You know, the, the concept, of course, of working with partners has kind of been in place since the beginning of business. Um, but the technology has changed so dramatically now that things like single window are a real possibility to do at uh, a cost point that we could never do in the past. You know, I can think of examples now in, in some of the public sector clients. I certainly see it in cities, um, in some of the, the provinces around the world where these, these cities or provinces are building single access points for citizens and for businesses that allow, um, you know, for example, to start a business by going to one place, entering the information once, and having, you know, sort of technology work with all the various ministries, agencies, and departments to start that business. Um, there's examples now where you can start businesses in, in some countries in a matter of two or four hours when it used to take two or four months. And uh, the one thing that I've seen change is to do this a few years ago, uh, when, when organizations try to do a, a, a program like that, it might be 50 million euro. Uh, today you can do that kind of thing for five million euro. So, so the, the cost uh, model has changed uh, dramatically. There's a couple other points in there for sure. One is that um, you know, we're able to deal with a lot more data. There's a lot more data flowing through the process, through the supply chain, through the, the customs organization. And so we've got to process and filter that data. But at the end of the day, it's about driving a much better outcome, uh, much quicker. You know, we're able to facilitate trade much better and do it at a cost point that we've never been able to do it before. The second, uh, the second trend I want to just uh, get a little bit more on is this uh, point around design for analytics. We all hear a lot about uh, analytics, and, you know, it's big data, all the rest of that. Um, you know, I've been in the business for, for a long time, and I sort of see trends come and go. Um, and, you know, the, the words will change, but, you know, I, I know for a fact that this concept around analytics and really using information to, to understand what's going on is a true change in, in how businesses operate. And uh, there's no question that, you know, these organi you know, customs organizations have a tremendous amount of data. In fact, you know, almost arguably we have too much data. It's really about getting the right data. 
filtering through all that data and getting to the piece of information that tells us what we want to know. A great example is the contents of a box. Um, how often do we really know what's inside a box based on facts, based on the data that's being provided? When we look at the, the technology landscape, uh, the technology that's out there today with the amount of processing power, with the sophistication of the tools, allows an organization to process you know, sort of incredible amounts of data, both public data, private data, bringing that all together to, to answer the question we want to answer. You know, I see examples of this uh, in many different places. Um, you know, one example I see now, which, uh, you know, really kind of shocks me, is, is we now have clients that are looking at uh, social expenditures and taking the data uh, applicants provide when they sign up for a social payment and unemployment um, payment. And uh, these clients are now taking that information and going out into the public domain and trying to assess whether this is legitimate data, whether the person's trying to maybe get paid a little bit more, maybe they're not legitimately even available to get uh, that payment. So marrying truly public data that's out there in the internet and the public domain with application data to try to identify uh, fraud and, and non-compliance. So, you know, th that's just one example, and, and we see uh, many opportunities across sort of all the functions of government. When we look at customs, um, you know, sort of the, it's easy to say, you know, analytics offers a lot of power, but when we start to take that down a question, we, we say to ourselves, how do we design this into the system? How do we design this into the process? It really starts to change how we should all think about this. So if you take a look at the, the sort of the examples up there, I think one of the great ones is how do we detect collusion between various traders in the supply chain, right? So how do we know whether the traders are working together to maybe move a good, you know, not pay the, the duties or maybe it's a security risk? What information do we need to get to, to be able to assess that. Do we have that information today? How do we change the process to get that information? Do maybe we have to go out into the public domain to get that type of information? And there's many examples of that, I think. Um, you know, there's a couple more shown there. Can, can we get the information from the consumer, whoever's buying that good, uh, directly from them? Can we get it directly from the manufacturer or the retailer so we know it's inside that box, be able to look at trends over time, uh, et cetera? Being able to do this, design it into the, the processes, into the data we gather, uh, really allows us to fundamentally change uh, how the process works and the value we get out of that. And I think it con connects very well with the last point, which is around speed, you know, what we call data velocity. And you know, if we think about the, the ability to sort of take all this information to, you know, together, make a decision, and really put it in the hands of an operator, so, you know, certainly one of the phenomenon we all see is mobility and you know, everybody's got a device today. They're very cheap. Uh, so they're, you know, they're really becoming uh, typical, common. It's not, it's not an exception anymore. Now to be able to put data onto that device for an operator that's based on, you know, deep insight, this information perhaps coming from the consumer, the manufacturer, being able to do risk assessments against this, look for potential revenue leakage, and provide that, the simple point that an inspector needs to open that specific box, that specific container at that point in time, uh, is really, you know, gives us the ability to revolutionize the, the process uh, and move us from a sort of a model of random inspection to a very intelligent way of opening up boxes, inspecting and making sure, you know, duties are being paid, uh, Security is being, you know, properly assessed, uh, et cetera. And at the end of that, I bring it all back to this point that, that we believe every business out there is either already a digital business or will soon need to become uh, a digital business. And, and, you know, we certainly see this in the custom space. There's a couple of sort of big trends that I think we all have to consider. One, you know, the citizens of the world are really digital citizens. Um, you know, one of, one of the points I'd make is that, uh, you know, in many, many countries now, uh, there's, a, there's a citizen ID, and, and they operate with this citizen ID. Uh, it's becoming a widely adopted model. India's in the process of putting this in place. Uh, you know, I lived in Singapore. I had one in Singapore, and I transacted virtually everything I did 
uh, with this digital ID. So I, I was, you know, I had a virtual life, you know, brought to me by the government. Um, so we have to, you know, accept that and recognize that a lot of the goods that citizens buy is now really being done through the, the digital channel e-commerce. Uh, we see the numbers. Uh, the growth is going to continue to the point where, you know, likely half of the goods bought will be done via e-commerce. Uh, so how do we as a, as a customs organizations handle that and make sure it's done properly? Certainly one of the ones that's gotten a lot of attention lately uh, is 3D printing. Um, you know, will this become a fundamental, you know, kind of game changer in the world? You know, I, I guess time will tell. Uh, but, you know, the, the risks it poses from a security point of view, uh, from a revenue point of view, are, are really, you know, a little bit hard to get our heads wrapped around. But, you know, we can't ignore these trends. We have to uh, adapt to them. And, and so, you know, it takes us back to this point of, you know, we believe, you know, number one, that the organizations have to transform how they operate. Uh, and, and embrace this technology to improve the operations, drive the outcomes we want. Um, and that's really the, you know, the heart of, of what I wanted to talk about. So what we've done, uh, as I, I mentioned, you know, our technology group has produced this uh, Accenture technology vision. Um, our customs team, uh, which is uh, globally based, but you know, we have a, a booth outside, we work in many countries, is taking that technology vision and, and you know, developing our point of view around how we in this industry have to apply this uh, to the customs process and, and change how we operate. So we're in the process of doing that. Um, we'll publish that soon, but our technology vision's already out there on the web. I invite you to take a look at that and certainly love to have conversations about this and, and get your point of view about how you see this, how it's affecting uh, your organization and your country. Um, and so certainly feel free to to visit uh, the team at the booth outside. Um, and the final point I'd say is, you know, we'll continue, you know, we've been in this industry for many years, as uh, was pointed out. Uh, we are an original sponsor of this event. And we'll continue to do this research. We'll continue to uh, invest in this, uh, this industry. And, and certainly um, your, your thoughts and ideas on where we should apply our resources to help you, um, you know, succeed and, and develop your strategies for the future is, is welcome. So with that, I thank you. Again, it's, uh, it's a pleasure to be here, an honor to be here. Um, I thank our, uh, our organizers. And uh, with that, I'll turn it back to uh, Susanna. Thanks. Thank you, Brian. Um, I would say that was setting the scene already and uh, replied at least to some questions concerning the uh, very important uh, questions, how to share data. So there are some possibilities out there. Now uh, to our keynote speech for this morning, uh, Mr. Desler Tanis, uh, an old friend uh, of WCO from IATA, where he is the global head of cargo. And as I've mentioned yesterday, and as I'm sure he'll say, we have a very good working relationship. Uh, and um, I recommend uh, to listen to his speech that will highlight a little bit where we are. Marhaba Kefalik. Good morning, everybody, your excellencies, ladies and gentlemen. It is indeed my uh, pleasure to be uh, almost coming home to deliver this keynote address on the theme of coordinated border management and specifically to address how we can together explore the ways that modern information and communication technology can lead the exciting possibility for a whole of government approach at the borders. For those who don't know me, uh, uh, I am the global head of cargo at IATA. Uh, prior to joining IATA two and a half years ago, I happened to have had the privileged position of being the executive vice president cargo at Etihad Airways just down the road, uh, and had three and a half wonderful years among you. Um, I was born in Myanmar. Um, and I'm privileged, obviously, in the light of all the publicity that Myanmar is getting, or Burma as I knew it, um, 
to realize that when I came to England in 62, of course, I always considered myself an Anglo-Burman until I reached the age of uh, 14 and talking to my friend when suddenly one day my father heard me tell everybody that I was a Anglo-Burman. And he said, no, my son, you're actually an Anglo-Armenian. It's the first time I've ever heard the word Armenian in my life, and I have to tell you, I thought I'd contracted a disease. But being of uh, also mixed race, where my mother was Irish, my father then went on to tell me, don't worry, son, an Armenian is somebody who prospers in business and are great tradesmen. So I thought my life was secure, but I forgot how strong the Irish genes were which is why I end up in the field of air cargo. But your excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, let me firstly thank graciously my dear friend, Susan, uh, and thank the WCO and Dubai Customs for inviting me to this auspicious event. ICAO and the WCO have a long, long history of collaboration and cooperation on customs and border management related topics. A practical example of our collaboration being, of course, the recent WCO, IATA, and ICAO have jointly agreed on the maximum set of API data that should be incorporated in the PACS LST message that's used for the transmission of such data by aircraft operators around the world to the border control agencies in the destination or departure country as stated in ICAO's Annex 9 under the facilitation annex to the Convention on International Civil Aviation. On the cargo side, however, IATA and WCO have a very long-standing tradition on collaboration. The first MOU signed between the two organizations took place in 1988 to strengthen collaboration and cooperation on customs airlines electronic messages. And more recently, the two organizations signed a new MOU. This took place in 2010 at our World Cargo Symposium in Vancouver. And that was to expand the collaboration and to further consult on projects of common interest, of which I will talk later, such as E-Freight, the E-Airway Bill, obviously the SAFE framework of standards, and the WCO's data model itself. As an example of this uh, collaboration, I want to just draw attention to the latest cargo XML messaging that was presented to the WCO only last month, and which, of course, is aligned comprehensively and completely with the WCO's own data model that facilitates increasing airline customs communication. So what about air cargo? Why do we see such huge importance in our collaboration? Well, you all know, and you've been hearing these stats for many, many years, that air cargo today is merely 1%, believe it or not, it's less than 1% of volume that is traded around the world. So why all the fuss? But you also know it actually, that 1%, represents 35% by value of global trade. That's in excess of $6 trillion. More importantly, if you look at air cargo, it sustains every aspect of urban life. And as we end up with capital cities reaching multi-million in the demographics, the only way to sustain urban life is through a comprehensive and efficient, safe and secure air cargo transportation. But to people who work in the airline business, what we didn't know, and I wish I knew this when I was at Etihad, certainly, is that on average, air cargo represents 12% of an airline's revenues. That's three times more than the first class revenue. I just wish we got three times more of the marketing budget when I was at the airline. You will not be surprised to hear, therefore, that IATA fully supports coordinated border management, and we welcome the efforts of the WCO and its member states in driving this initiative forward. 
When we talked of industry collaboration, I reached out to the WCO, uh, incidentally, whose Secretary General regularly attends and participates as a guest speaker, keynote speaker at the World Cargo Symposium. I reached out to Susan when we set up an industry collaboration called the Global Air Cargo Advisory Group, which brought together the shipping community, by shippers I mean manufacturers, distributors, the freight forwarding community through FIATA, obviously my own association, IATA, representing the airlines, and a body called TIACA. And Susan very kindly said of the WCO that we would be delighted to be strategic partners in your pursuit of four main themes, e-commerce, security, aviation security, trade facilitation, and of course, sustainability. In every one of those, the WCO plays an active role. Carriers, including many airlines, are often the main party interfacing with law enforcement agencies, particularly across borders and as such are expected to provide advanced electronic information related to passengers, cargo, mail, to numerous entities, including the Customs, Border Police, Veterinary, Immigration Services, and the licensing and state authorities. In this respect, the airlines are often held solely accountable when they are not the owners or originators of the information. For this reason, IATA has always strongly promoted the WCO safe framework of standards and calling for the global harmonization when states implement this type of data. Often, there's a significant duplication of paper-based procedures, the data required by border agencies and the repetition of physical activities on arrival or before departure is to the detriment of all. Let's take recent efforts by the US CBP in the form of ACAS. IATA continues to lobby all its airlines through GACAG, all the forwarding participants to participate with the US CBP's ACAS pilot program. The reason we see this as necessity is because we want to ensure that the data provision through the air cargo advanced screening pilots are providing the data elements that industry can manage ahead of rulemaking that will emerge in quarter three this year. And as an example, we know that systems that still rely heavily on paper-based solutions for customs declaration and supporting documents can result in the provision of poor or inaccurate data which neither assists customs with any form of risk analysis and accurate calculation of duties, nor trade with the delays and administrative costs associated with making the necessary corrections. I hope you'll all agree that this duplication is both inefficient for both government and their trade community and adds additional non-tariff barrier costs. Thus, these obstacles hinder countries' ability to trade competitively around the global markets. So we strongly believe that customs, other border agencies and trade need to act together to embrace the current instruments available and the tools that will help improve efficiency. Of course, this must always be done, not be done, I beg your pardon, at the expense of any citizen's safety and security. The implementation of the revised Kyoto, Kyoto Convention as the blueprint for a modernized custom service and its provisions and standards can assist us to reach the end goal of a coordinated border management. Furthermore, the WCO's documents entitled Coordinated Border Management from Theory to Practice and Coordinated Border Management, a concept paper, gives a very helpful insight on the steps required along this path. But I would like now to turn my attention to the topic under discussion during your session, which is to explore the ways that modern information and communication technology can lead to an exciting possibility for a whole new government approach 
at the border. In this context, I want to share with you a number of initiatives within the airline industry that seek to support the whole government approach through a coordinated private sector approach. I'm sure you've all heard and repeatedly heard about the industry's e-freight program, which is to link the entire supply chain of consignor, consignees, freight forwarders, ground handling, uh, handling air, uh, entities and airlines with customs in a seamless, paperless process. Key to e-freight is the ability of these entities to connect and use modern technologies, which will allow to identify the data required by the border agencies and then to make this available in an electronic format. E-Freight today is currently live in 47 countries and administrative regions covering 462 airports around the globe. Our vision and our goal, as agreed by industry, is to have 80% of the globe covered by December 2015. We need your assistance, your leadership, and your support in order to achieve this mutually beneficial objective. The first element of this, of course, for an airline has been the facilitation of the electronic airway bill. We believe this is such an important catalyst to E-Freight that we have set a very ambitious goal of 20% global adoption this year. I have to be very complimentary to a lot of the customs regimes, and I want to thank numerous state customs authorities for their assistance in accepting a paperless airway bill despite not having necessarily the funds or the capital investment to have brought your existing systems up to date. The reason this is important is that these solutions that help both you and our industry are needed today and not tomorrow. Following the shipment of explosive concealed in ink cartridges from Yemen in October 2010, IATA worked very collaboratively uh, collaboratively with the regulators, with forwarders and ground handlers to develop a consignment security declaration that identified who has applied the security measures, to what extent, when, and how. The consignment security declaration, or as we call it in the acronym, the CSD, can be tr transmitted electronically today using internationally recognized messaging standards. All this through the supply chain and can be made available to customs and other border agencies on request. And I was delighted to have the pleasure of talking to Jonathan, who you'll be hearing from later, who was telling me that he'd like to experiment with the CSD from Kenya. And we'd be happy to collaborate with him on that. I'm also pleased to inform you that in collaboration with ICAO and its states, a revised global standard of the electronic uh, cargo security declaration will be adopted in the guidance material of ICAO's Annex 17. And this will be effective as of July 2013. I would now like to turn my attention to the future of coordinated border management. The application of the single window approach is clearly of the utmost importance with both border agencies and trade alike. The consideration of a single window implementation can often seem daunting. However, as time goes by and more countries are deploying single windows, this will provide opportunities to benefit from lessons learned. The United Nations Economic Commission for Europe maintains a single window repository that not only provides recommendations and guidelines for establishing a single window, but it also contains examples of best, practice, uh, best practices through the globe. I would encourage you to provide the repository if you intend to implement such a tool. 
Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, I would also like to extend to you the opportunity when we're talking of collaboration to please look out to join us at the next World Cargo Symposium, which will trend, uh, take place in Los Angeles next March. We really do invite customs participation uh, at this uh, industry event, which sets to agree and decide on rulemaking and things that the agent, that the industry strongly requires. Finally, your excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, I would once again like to thank the WCO, the Secretary General, to Susan and her team, and of course, to Dubai Customs, our host, once more for the invitation, and I wish all participants a very successful conference. Thank you very much. Thank you, Des. Uh, I think that illustrated uh, the close cooperation and also illustrated the need for close cooperation and you know, finding joint solution. Now, uh, let's turn to our first panel um, on the national perspective on coordinated border management solutions. Our facilitator, already mentioned by Des, uh, Mr. Jonathan Coe, Director, Trade Facilitation Center of Excellence from Crimson Logic. Um, Crimson Logic is very busy implementing uh, single window solutions in many countries. And um, he has close involvement also in ASEAN's uh, single window and many other initiatives. Um, I don't want to take up too much of your time. So Jonathan, if you want to come to the podium. Good morning, uh, Your Excellencies and ladies and gentlemen. Um, this panel's discussion will be on the topic of national perspective, customs, and the, co and the other border agencies to enable a coordinated border management. So without further ado, may I invite the speakers to come aboard. Uh, Mr. Paolo Kasavi, Tim, and uh, Mr. Van Doren from the Netherlands, you can come, right. Um, I, I think uh, I'll start this, uh, there will be three, we have gonna be, we're gonna have three speakers. And uh, this topic of national perspective, is gonna be very exciting because uh, we're gonna have an architect, a lawyer, and a customs officer giving their national perspective on how customs and the other border, border agencies are coordinated. And I think that uh, right now, I'm in the midst of a single window implementation in Kenya. And right now, in the midst of the discussions between the agencies on how they are coordinating, how they are going to exchange data, how they're going to make trade facilitation smoother for the country. So without further ado, let me just uh, introduce uh, Mr. Paolo Kasavi. Uh, Mr. Kas Paolo, Paolo Kasavi is an architect. He has served as an architect in the private sector for 17 years. And in the last five years, he, was, he is with the Federal Administration of Public Revenue. Today, he serves as a Deputy Director General of Planning in the Argentina Federal Administra Administrator of Public, Agents, Public uh, Revenues. And I think that it's very interesting to hear the perspective of the building administrator, the planning administrator, as their role as a border agency vis-a-vis -vis a coordinated border management. Mr. Kasavi, the floor is yours. Buenos días a todos. Daré mi, presión, mi exposición en español por pedido expreso de la OMA. Eh, antes que nada, bueno, 
Buenos días a todos. Eh, agradecerles a las autoridades de Dubai, de la aduana de Dubai, aduanas en general, expositores y participantes. Eh, tengo a mi cargo la, dirección, la Subdirección General de Planificación de AFIP en la República Argentina. Eh, la Administración Federal de Ingresos Públicos tiene tres unidades de negocios, tales son la Dirección General Impositiva, la Dirección General de Aduanas y la Dirección General de los Recursos de la Seguridad Social. Eh, a mi cargo tengo el planeamiento edilicio de, las, de los edificios en todo el país, eh, la gestión de convenios en general con, 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 con las provincias. Ok, I wait. Bueno, creo que todos tienen sus auriculares. Eh, bueno, como les comentaba, tengo a mi cargo el entrenamiento edilicio de, de la totalidad de la, de la organización, esto es la coordinación de todos los edificios a lo largo, a lo ancho del país, la gestión de convenios con organismos, provincias y municipios y la coordinación de la totalidad del plan de gestión del organismo. Eh, bueno, agradezco la posibilidad de, de, de estar aquí y poder contarles lo que estamos haciendo en la República Argentina en relación a la gestión coordinada de fronteras. Bueno, para ponerlos en contexto, la República Argentina, en 2,8 millones de kilómetros cuadrados en el continente americano, ubicada en el hemisferio sur, ubicamos desde los 22 grados de latitud sur hasta los 55, 3.800 kilómetros de longitud, limitamos con eh, Uruguay, Brasil, Paraguay, Bolivia y la República de Chile. La totalidad de población en el país suma 42 millones, es el número 32 en el mundo, y el dato saliente es que tenemos 9.376 kilómetros de longitud de fronteras terrestres, nada más que terrestres. En el cuadro pueden ver eh, un poquito el, el, el resumen de esto. Tenemos gran variedad de climas y de geografía en la República Argentina con impactantes, impactantes contrastes. Tenemos eh, los Andes en el oeste, planicies, sierras y diversidad de climas es lo que hacen la diversidad en, en nuestro país. Con Chile 
Tenemos 5.308 kilómetros, 1.699 con Paraguay, 1.132 con Brasil, 742 kilómetros con Bolivia, 495 kilómetros con Uruguay y un litoral marítimo de más de 5.000 kilómetros. Esto hace un total de casi 15.000 kilómetros de fronteras continentales. En respuesta a esto, el control aduanero lo resolvemos con 153 terminales portuarias y pasos fronterizos, 14 de estos últimos organizados como área de control integrado, que son el motivo de esta presentación en general. 24 aeropuertos internacionales y 59 aduanas repartidas a lo largo y a lo ancho del país. Todo esto para ponerlos en contexto de, de lo que vamos a tratar de, de contarles enseguida. La evolución de la demanda de los servicios aduaneros por parte del comercio exterior y los flujos migratorios. Nos encontramos frente a un proceso de globalización mundial, devenido en los últimos años en cada rincón del planeta, que viene motorizando en gran manera los flujos de comercio exterior y migratorios. Las tecnologías de información y comunicación son el, son el factor que posibilita este extraordinario acontecimiento histórico planetario y la creciente interdependencia de los mercados mundiales, fusionando economías, sociedades y culturas mediante transformaciones culturales, políticas y económicas, son un hecho a la fecha. Las tecnologías han posibilitado la reducción de las barreras de comercio internacional a la, y la, en respuesta a las corrientes financieras, así como también al fortalecimiento y expansión de las denominadas empresas multinacionales. Para contarles la evolución del movimiento migratorio en los brazos fronterizos en lo que hace a personas, hemos tomado 10 años para el análisis. En el año 2002, 17.300.000 personas eh, cruzaban por nuestras fronteras y en el año 2012, 46.100.000. Esto es un, un incremento del 266%. Casi 30 millones más de personas se movilizaron por las fronteras del país. El intercambio comercial, lo mismo, en 10 años, 25.650 millones de dólares en el año 2002, eh, a 78 millones 300 mil en el año 2012, esto es un 700% de incremento en las exportaciones y en las importaciones un 300%. El movimiento de contenedores es de, de la razón de 1.150.000 por mes. Eh, frente a esto, eh, analizamos eh, un cuadro que es este, las fortalezas, oportunidades, debilidades y amenazas. Como fortalezas, a ver, ahí está. Las fortalezas, la gestión coordinada y el marco de seguridad de la OMA. Tratamos de basarnos en este concepto para establecer lo, la, todas las acciones que hemos tomado como fundamentales. La oportunidad es instalar la percepción de riesgo en cuanto a las tecnologías no intrusivas, la informatización y la colaboración internacional. La debilidad frente a este escenario es el volumen y la celeridad necesaria. Esto es la necesidad de los operadores de disponer de sus mercaderías y personas en lo que hace a migración. Y la amenaza es la rentabilidad de la actividad ilícita a causa de la globalización y la mutación. ¿Cómo responde la aduana argentina ante la creciente demanda? Primero, con la optimización de los controles de frontera. Esto es, las creaciones de las áreas de control integrado. En las últimas décadas del siglo XX, con el advenimiento de las democracias en la región, evolucionó el concepto de frontera ya no como límite, sino como una zona de frontera, como un ámbito integrador de unión y de apertura entre países y vecinos. Este proceso de integración tiene como meta construir un espacio sudamericano integrado. Ha ido comprometiéndose a través de la conformación de diversos acuerdos internacionales que promueven el desarrollo de la infraestructura de transporte, de energía y de comunicaciones bajo una visión regional, con la pretensión ello de promover la facilitación y seguridad de la cadena logística internacional y flujos migratorios, en pos del debido desarrollo económico, social y cultural. Es necesario entonces el acondicionamiento de las fronteras para comprender entonces estas medidas y proyectos de facilitación administrativa, de simplificación y de armonización documental, de mejora o de construcción de infraestructura vial y ferroviaria, y un desarrollo de infraestructura en los complejos fronterizos de los pasos de frontera. 
Control integrado de frontera, el ámbito político, el Mercosur, Chile y Bolivia, con el objetivo de optimizar los controles fronterizos entre los países integrantes del Merc Grupo Mercosur mediante el de denominado Acuerdo de Recife. Se aprobaron los términos de aplicación de los controles integrados de frontera. El principio que arregla la actividad de, los áreas, de las eh, áreas coordinadas de frontera se basa en la aplicación de procedimientos administrativos y operativos compatibles y similares en forma secuencial y en ocasiones que fuera posible, también simultánea. Las modalidades que hemos implementado en la Argentina para, los, para las áreas coordinadas e integradas son país entrada, país sede, país de salida, país sede y cabecera única. Eh, hemos creado comités de integración con los países vecinos y con grupos técnicos de cooperación y facilitación fronteriza. También es, es dable mencionar el Código de Anero del Mercosur, aprobado por el Consejo del Mercado Común mediante decisión del, del año 2010, incorpora varios tips a la legislación aduanera del Estado parte. El primero y fundamental para nosotros es la preeminencia de las administraciones aduaneras en el ejercicio de la competencia sobre los demás organismos de administración pública en las zonas primarias aduaneras. Luego la asistencia recíproca entre dichas administraciones, eh, siguiendo los preceptos de la OMA, trabajar con lo que es operador económico calificado, la utilización de sistemas informáticos y medios de transmisión electrónica y el intercambio de información de documentos entre administraciones aduaneras. Eh, luego la intensificación del uso del gobierno electrónico. El arribo de las tecnologías en los últimos tiempos, las tecnologías de información y comunicaciones, en particular Internet, han incrementado, ha incrementado las capacidades de los gobiernos de fortalecer los procesos de información de capacitación de funcionarios, de interactuar con proveedores de bienes y servicios, de su capacidad de brindar y entregar más y mejores servicios públicos a la ciudadanía. El gobierno electrónico y su desarrollo tiene un impacto importante en la organización del sistema, de la, en la gestión interna de administraciones públicas y las interrelaciones entre organismos que intervienen en procesos de control nacionales y extrafronterizos, cuya finalidad fundamental es, es la facilitación de los flujos comerciales y turísticos sumando también en las tecnologías el mejor diseño y aprovechamiento de los perfiles de riesgo, aportando la cuota correspondiente de seguridad. Y como tercer punto importante para nosotros también es la aplicación del marco de seguridad de la OMA. Hace el aprovechamiento de estas tecnologías y la gestión coordinada para dar respuestas a las necesidades de la sociedad en la materia, sobre la base de cuatro elementos básicos. La armonización de los requisitos de información electrónica, el enfoque, el enfoque de análisis de riesgo, la utilización de equipos de inspección no intrusivos, como ser de rayos X y detectores de radiación, y el concepto de operador económico responsable. Esto dando beneficios a la, que las aduanas ofrecen a las empresas que cumplen con las normas de seguridad en la cadena logística. Hemos desarrollado en la Argentina varios sistemas de software y de, en general, digamos, para lo que son flujo comercial. Estos son, a modo de ejemplo, Cintia, Indira, Eloea y Rilo, digamos, son sistemas informáticos de tránsito aduanero. Y para lo que son flujo turístico, el ENISA, que es para entrada y salida de vehículos, y el sistema, una variante para lo que son sistemas de, de renta car. En lo que hace a controles no intrusivos, la iniciativa ISTA o PEMA, que es el precinto electrónico de monitoreo aduanero. Esto lo pueden ver claramente en el stand que tenemos en la exposición en el salón contiguo. Es un, eh, bueno, una iniciativa, un sistema orientado a los tránsitos de mercadería transportados por camiones por el territorio nacional, mediante la utilización de un precinto electrónico. Eh, permite esto a la aduana argentina determinar y conocer en tiempo real los desvíos de ruta, detenciones, novedades o contingencias y, o alarmas finalmente que establezcan en el curso de las operaciones a fin de adoptar las medidas necesarias para el resguardo de las mercaderías. En virtud de ello, los operadores del comercio exterior tienen la posibilidad de acceder a importantes beneficios que permiten agilizar su operatoria y mejorar los costos de la misma. Dicha iniciativa incorpora innovaciones tecnológicas que garantizan la circulación fluida y segura de las mercaderías preservando integridad de la carga y optimizando la seguridad, facilitando la cadena logística en concordancia con lo indicado por la OMA. La iniciativa Megaports, esta es una iniciativa que le hemos trabajado en conjunto con el gobierno de los Estados Unidos. Se han instalado en el puerto de Buenos Aires 19 portales detectores de radiación 
lo que hace esto es mejorar la seguridad en lo que hace a, en radia, a posibles eh, radiaciones y, y actividad nuclear. Finalmente, bueno, el uso de camiones scanners. Eh, está, está en la Argentina funcionando una dotación de 12 camiones scanners de última generación. Este año estamos en pleno proceso de licitación para la compra de 13 camiones scanners más. Eh, preguntarán por qué es camiones scanners. Esto es por la diversidad de fronteras y por la longitud y por, por las extensiones que tenemos que manejar. Es por eso que es mucho más práctico para nosotros manejarnos con camiones y no con escáneres fijos. Um, en la Administración Federal de Ingresos Públicos ha dispuesto a partir del día 15 de abril de este año que todos los depósitos fiscales en la República Argentina a habilitar deben contar con escáneres fijos para la detección de posibles este, irregularidades en la mercadería que allí se, se guarde. Caso práctico de gestión coordinada de frontera, el caso del sistema Cristo, del paso del sistema Cristo Redentor. El denominado sistema Cristo Redentor se ubica en la cordillera de los Andes, en una zona de frontera entre la República Argentina y Chile. Este paso es la concreción del de corredor bioceánico. Eh, un área geográfica que abarca 3,1 millones de kilómetros cuadrados, concentra el 63% de las actividades económicas entre Chile, Argentina, Brasil y Uruguay. Los países que lo integran, una población de 135 millones de habitantes. Es el 50, representa, pasa por aquí el 50% del PBI de los países mencionados. El eje está consolidado desde el punto de vista de infraestructura vial, ferroviaria, de terminales portuales y aeropuertos. Confluyen en él las aduanas, migraciones, organismos de control sanitario de alimentos y animales, fuerzas de seguridad, organismos encargados de la seguridad vial, reguladores de transportes, bancos y bueno, servicios de logística en general. Esto es de Argentina y Chile. Todo esto convive en el complejo ubicado en la localidad de Uspallata, en la provincia de Mendoza. Bueno, este paso, ya como indica la gráfica, en lo que hace a cargas se ha consolidado la cabecera única y hemos llegado a la concreción de lo que es la ventanilla única para, para lo que son cargas. Y en lo que hace a turismo, y, y digamos separado de lo que es carga, trabajamos lo que es, en, en lo que es el ingreso a Chile, es Chile quien es eh, sede, y en, lo, y en el ingreso a Argentina, es Argentina quien es cabecera de recepción también. ¿Por qué contarles este paso? Por la evolución que ha tenido el, a personas atendidas en turismo, desde el año 2002 al 2012 ha variado de 242.000 personas a 1.900.000. 38.000 vehículos en el año 2002 a 300.000 en el año 2012. Y en lo que hace a carga, 200.000 unidades en el año 2002 a 310.000 en el año 2012. Bueno. Otro caso práctico a contarles, eh, creo que todos ustedes lo deben conocer, el, el Rally Dakar se lleva a cabo en la República Argentina, Chile y Perú. Entre el 5 y el 20 de enero pasado se llevó a cabo la edición número 34 de este exigente evento internacional. A los fines de cumplimentar altos estándares de eficiencia que dicha organización requiere, fue fundamental la planificación de las actividades de control en frontera con énfasis en la gestión coordinada. El apoyo en medios de control no intrusivo resultó fundamental para el éxito. Eh, como síntesis, puedo comentarles que eh, este año era entre en Brasil, Perú y Chile, 8.000 kilómetros de recorrido, los controles fueron ubicados a 4.900 metros sobre el nivel del mar, 459 vehículos participantes representando 53 nacionalidades, 964 vehículos de apoyo, se trabajó en colaboración con la organización, eh, con sistemas no intrusivos de detección de todos los vehículos y con canes adiestrados, que es otra rama eh, que, que trabaja nuestra aduana argentina, donde cada vehículo se detenía y no estaba más de un minuto en el control. Esto, esto fue gracias a la tecnología desarrollada y a, y, al, y a la acción coordinada de frontera con los organismos chilenos. Otro caso práctico para contarles es el cruce de los Andes, que es una carrera pedestre en la que participan alrededor de, 200, de 2.000 personas perdón, desde hace 
13 años ya, eh, la, la República Argentina están estando a terminar. Pero bueno, quiero contarles que eh, también lo mismo, se, se trabajó con la aduana chilena y en los controles de frontera, eh, se tra, eh, digamos, se, la, la gente corría y cruza las fronteras casi sin detenerse. Esto es gracias a las acciones de, de, llevadas por la aduana. Bueno, con, como conclusión, la evolución del concepto de frontera desde el límite hacia los actuales contenidos de integración, cooperación y desarrollo ha llevado a los estados fronterizos a elaborar políticas conjuntas orientadas a facilitar la cadena logística internacional y el movimiento migratorio. Todo ello bajo adecuadas normas de seguridad y control. Las tecnologías y el avance del gobierno electrónico han posibilitado a nuestro país respuestas institucionales ante las crecientes demandas de servicios del gobierno de presente tipo. La gestión coordinada de frontera y el desempeño proactivo de las administraciones aduaneras se constituyen así en herramientas determinantes de éxito de políticas de desarrollo económico y social en los estados modernos. Esto es todo. Thank you, Mr. Castelli. I think the, some of the few points that he has mentioned is quite important with regards to the risk management between the other agencies and the customs. And our next speaker, uh, Mr. Frank Van Zoveren, uh, he will talk quite a lot on the coordination with regards to the food safety and with customs. Mr. F uh, Van, Van Zoveren has been with customs, Netherlands customs for many years, and he moved over to Netherlands Food and Consumer Product Safety Authority in the last three years. And I'm sure that he has, can share with you the perspective of having been in customs for so many years, and then from the perspective of coordinating with the food authority, the food and consumer authority uh, in the last three years. So without further ado, can I invite Mr. Van Zoren to come to the floor? You have 25 minutes. Thank you. Thank you, Jonathan. Um, ladies and gentlemen, dear border colleagues, I first want to thank the World uh, Customs Organization for your kind invitation to the Netherlands Food and Consumer Product Safety Authority to tell you something about our challenges and how we try to combine some solutions. I give you a brief insight of the volumes we have to deal with uh, in the Netherlands and in the European Union. I tell you something about our main tasks, an overview of the challenges and the direction of the solutions. And at the end, I will give some information about two cases. Uh, the Netherlands is a major trade country. We are the fifth uh, largest exporter and the seventh largest importer in the world as the main gate of Europe. Agricultural uh, trade has special significance to us. The Netherlands are the second agricultural exporter worldwide after the United States. You can see some numbers here showing this trade in monetary terms. Uh, the Netherlands is a major point of entry and exit of goods from the European Union. You can see the flow uh, of trade uh, here. The big fat red line shows the flow of goods coming into the Netherlands through our two major points of entry, the harbor of M Rotterdam and Amsterdam Airport. To protect uh, the safety and security of all European citizens and those of third countries the Netherlands trade with, uh, we perform checks on the goods traded through our country. This is where the Netherlands Food and Consumer Product, Product Safety Authority play an important role. Uh, the Netherlands Food and Consumer Product Safety Authority is a government inspection agency. Its mission is uh, to safeguard the safety of food and consumer products and the health of animals and plants. 
Safeguarding the safety of imported and exported goods is not only important for consumers, but also to facilitate trade in the Netherlands and in the European Union. Safeguarding the safety of imported and exported goods is not only important for consumers, but the authority invests heavily in arrangements with trade countries about testing, certification, and enforcement protocols to increase mutual trust and maintain and increase access to for foreign markets. The fast flow of goods in and outbound the Netherlands present our country with unique challenges to manage safety and facilitate trade. Of course, it wouldn't be possible to check each and every consignment, so we have to use a smart approach. First of all, one of the solutions is we have a very close cooperation with Dutch customs since we both have an important role concerning trade of goods through our, through our country. Our relationship can best de be described as that customs is a generalist at the first line when issues arise. Customs manage as a director the flow of all goods flowing through our country for the other uh, border inspection agencies. The, our authority itself is the specialist that takes on issues related to food safety, animal and plant health issues. Our approach from the Dutch authority is risk-based. But customs and our authority together identify the risks and make arrangements for selection of goods that need inspection. This way, we can guarantee safety of large trade volumes based on the inspection of smart samples. To optimize uh, our risk-based approach, we use a lot of information. We now mostly use information about the goods and hazards that may possible occur. However, I see a lot of opportunities to increase the type of information um, used to increase our knowledge about safety and security risk. For example, information about the credibility of actors in the supply chain. This is something we are now developing within our organization and in the Netherlands. I would like to work out this information-based approach by showing you the simplified uh, layered model of the supply chain. Horizontally, you see the supply chain. Uh, vertically, you see five layers of information that can be used to supervise the supply chain. In the middle, there is the normal logistic layer. This is where the goods are. Traditionally, our authority is mainly focused on this layer, inspecting goods, making sure that they do not contain rotten foods with diseases or other plant of animal diseases, etc. Making sure the goods are safe as our main task. To obtain information about goods that we do not inspect or when risk can't be discovered, when physical uh, checks uh, has been made, we use documents. These documents present information from the origin country and what measures they, they take to ensure safety of the goods. The three other layers, actors, financial and communication, present new opportunities. We use them, but not a lot yet. And we have to use them in the future because of two and very important reasons. One is the increasing amount of volume uh, of trade goods. And secondly, the non-compliance by traders or even fraud and criminal behavior that undermine the assurance that we are supposed, that they are supposed to offer. Increasing physical and documentary checks at the border is not longer the solution. We have to use information available to predict and check the behavior of traders and access risks of trade goods. First of all, the actor layer. Since goods, them, goods themselves do not commit fraud, but people do, 
information about the credibility of actors in the supply chain is an important asset for our organization. Also, when all actors in the supply chain are known to be credible, the entire chain can be regarded as a chain with higher safety assurance. With sufficient advantages for credible traders and disadvantages for non-credible traders, we stimulate credible traders to do only business and only trade with each other and so reinforce the safety in the entire chain. I'm quite jealous of the, the authorized economic operator system the European Customs Organization use. For our field of work, it would be beneficial if an authorized agro of an authorized food operator can be introduced in the near future. Of course, this requires not only the sharing, sharing of information between different countries, but also close cooperation between food safety authorities of these countries and the local customs organizations. We have made some steps in this area, which I will present later on. The other two layers also contain interesting information. The communication uh, layer contains information that may not be directly linked to specific uh, trade goods. We can use to infer information about trends and hypes. Examples are information from Twitter or specific uh, web forums on dodgy goods and shady trade. When you look into the internet, you can find shady trades. The financial layer, layer contains information from banks about financing tra trade and transport and information from uh, insurance companies and the checks those companies, banks and insurance companies make undertake to protect their own interests and that are very high financial stakes and we can combine goods and financial uh, stakes together. Nowadays, this information by banks and insurance companies is mostly only used in criminal investigations, but present great opportunities for use by customs and inspections agencies in the near future. It would be my dream to use information from all five layers in a system of cross-checks, horizontally and vertically, to obtain extra assurance about consignments and their possible risk and the uh, uh, risk in the near future. This layered supply chain model presents abstract opportunities for the future. Let me now tell you about a highly successful case where we applied at least part of this model in a novel way to increase the safety of imported consumer product, products from China. About 60 to 80 percent of the non-food products in the European Union, Union are imported from China. Most of them are imported through Rotterdam Harbor. This is a diverse and dynamic market with lots of different products and businesses uh, operating in this market. It's a market with high volumes driven to import at the low, lowest cost possible. In such a market, product safety is not a very high priority for the business operator, unfortunately. Some years ago, we came to the conclusion that our risk-based import checks were not going to be sufficient to, sa to safeguard the consumer safety when trade volumes would continue to raise. We also concluded that our control system did not take into account sufficiently the inspections the Chinese safety authority did before export. So we developed a different approach together with the Chinese safety authority. This picture gives a very little impression of the different projects, uh, products we have to deal with. And you must realize this picture is by far not complete. For instance, 
cosmetics are missing, but also playground equipment, fairground attractions, and whatsoever. This is just a pickup. The cooperation between the Dutch, the Netherlands Sa Safety Authority, and the Chinese Authority, HUSIQ, is based on the lead principle of safety at the source. The aim is to cooperate by making a control system where the combined export checks of the Chinese authority and our import checks would create a system of seamless and paperless surveillance. We did it at first to making two arrangements. That was the start. First, the exchange of expertise about testing methods for non-food products. We figured that when both countries use the same methods for safety testing, we would gain mutual trust between both countries, China and the Netherlands, and we would use discussions about what is right and what is wrong between the safety authorities itself and all the thousands of business operators. Secondly, we arranged the exchange of testing results between China and the Netherlands. This allows us to exclude products already tested by EQSIQ from our own import inspections, making our own import inspection more effi efficient. Also, this allows us to give feedback to our Chinese colleagues when unsafe products are detected, so that EQSIQ can take action to manufacturers producing unsafe products and they do all the, the last time. In a few years, through cooperation with IQSAQ, we together expand our safety supervision across the entire supply chain, instead of only the part of the chain in our own country, investigating at the source. This has presented both countries with several advantages. One, a reduction of double testing and more efficient inspections. Two, a better entry to market for uh, Chinese producers and, and also Dutch traders. And three, better consumer protection by focusing on the bad guys and bringing them down. The project manager who developed this uh, this project, uh, the, the, the cooperation between China and the Netherlands, is uh, Mr. Marijn Colijn, and he is the project manager, and he is uh, here present over here. And when you have some difficult questions, ask him. Uh, the second case I like to present uh, you is our endeavors in the electronic certification. Traditionally, goods are sent with paper documents, such as transport documents. However, agricultural goods also need plant and animal health and food safety certificates from export countries to import countries. But paper documents have their downsides, however. They are an outdated form of communication of safety tapes between governments and uh, that do not allow direct communication between the governments and that is therefore sensitive to fraud. Also, paper is an administrative burden, especially because they are physical objects and therefore need their own logistic, not always together with the goods, but sometimes separately. Of course, they have their use. But in our digital age, there are better options. We therefore, in the Netherlands, developed the client system, a system to support the digital exchange of certificates between governments and between government and businesses. It's based on open standards, connectivity is possible with custom systems, and it, and it has a secure transmissions. Client is a support system for the application of certification by businesses electronically 
It is a decision support system for our certifying officers in the field. And three, its system creates digital certificates that are communicated through a standard method of electronic messages and signed with an electronic signature. The system has been developed in the last uh, years, last three, four years, and this year it will be operational in the third uh, semester of uh, 2013 for all types of agricultural products, and that are several thousand products, is it possible? Of course, trading countries have to accept the Dutch system. When you are used and you only want to have paper, then it won't work. But currently, we have several cooperation projects with the uh, countries you see over here to implement the electronic certification with those uh, countries to facilitate our export to those countries. And later on, from the export from those countries to the European Union. Projects are pending at this moment with Turkey, Brazil, Japan, and Mexico. And there's major uh, trade countries uh, for the ne Netherlands. Um, and I come slightly to my conclusions. Yes, there are a lot of possibilities to increase enforcement. And second level, to facilitate trade. But I have to say it's very clear that our first goal is enforcement and not only to facilitate trade, the second goal. Um, and a lot of what I said is technology, but I'm convinced that technology, uh, it is technology based, but it starts with collaboration uh, between countries and between agencies and customs. And it is not about only about customs, that is only also for the other border agencies, local and worldwide. And only with collaboration and then using te technology, I think that will be the right direction. But there are many possible ways to, to give it a boost for, uh, for trade, but also for security and safety. Thank you for your attention. So that was very interesting from Frank. And what we learned is that uh, focus on the bad guys. So without further ado, let me introduce the next speaker, uh, Mr. Tim Chapman. Tim is the first Assistant Secretary of the Australian Department of Agriculture, Fisheries and Forestry. Uh, Tim spent 13 years, 13, 14 years in the Australian customs before he moved over to the Department of Agriculture, Fisheries and Forestry. And uh, in these 13 years, I understand that he's involved in litigation and also catching the bad guys. So he can tell a lot about how he, uh, he catch the bad guys. And uh, without further ado, let, uh, it, sorry, before that, he spent seven years, now seven years in the Department of Agriculture. And I'm sure that we can learn from him about the interagency coordination since that he has spent from customs and now to the Department of Agriculture. Tim, sorry. Ladies and gentlemen, good morning. It's been 13 years since I've been to a WCO meeting, and I'd actually very much like to thank the World Customs Organization for inviting me and to Dubai Customs for hosting this event. I thought I'd start by providing a bit of context about my department, and hopefully that will explain why the WCO thought fit to invite me here today. The Department of Agriculture, Fisheries and Forestry in Australia is a department of about 5,000 people and as you'd imagine, it looks after the nation's agriculture, fisheries and forestry. But one of the key parts of the organisation and a part that I'm largely responsible for is biosecurity. And that's a system that we have in place to prevent pests and diseases that have the potential to cause harm to our environment, 
to uh, agricultural industries and to people in the country from getting in. We have about 2,000 staff stationed at the border doing entry management and inspection work on goods that come into the country. And I think along with New Zealand, we have one of the most robust and I think some people might even say intrusive biosecurity systems in the world. And I don't know, but I suspect that our border biosecurity staff would be one of the largest in the world. Now, why is that? I can assure you from having had to spend 15 hours on a plane to get here, that Australia is a long way from everywhere else. So for those geof geographic reasons, the fact that we're an island, the fact that we're a long way from anywhere, means that Australia does not have many of the animal and plant pests and diseases that are present in other parts of the country. And it's really critical for our economic, environmental, and for social reasons that we keep it that way. For a start, like the Netherlands, Australia is a trading nation. About 60% of our agricultural production is exported, and we are among the world's largest exporters of wheat, beef, dairy, and wool products. And it is our freedom for many of these other pests and diseases that affect other parts of the world that gives us an advantage in trade terms. It means that our industries can be efficient and it means that the products that we produce are seen as desirable in other parts of the world. Um, there are other issues which come into it too and they're very important and I think this is one of the challenges that organisations have when they're trying to collaborate and coordinate there at the border. Australia being a clean and green country, relatively, has become part of the national psyche. And because of that, it is polit politically important. And so when there is an outbreak of a pest or a disease, there is always a very significant political and social response to it. And that really enforces us to maintain our activities at the border. Now, with such a large border presence, it is critical that we work closely with customs to identify and manage risks. But it's very important to note that the risks that we're trying to deal with are quite different from the risks that customs is dealing with. In very general terms, customs works to prevent the importation of you know, illegal products such as drugs and weapons, and it has a revenue collection role. Um, there is obviously a strong focus in customs on deliberate illegal activity, and it's that focus which people have been discussing in the course of this conference, and it's that focus which determines much of the way that customs works. The biosecurity risks that I'm trying to deal with at the border are quite different. They may be accidental or they might be deliberate. They may be associated with the commodity that's been imported and a simple example of that is a diseased plant. Um, they may be associated with the packing material, such as termite infesting the, the dunnage, or with the container itself. So ants or giant African snails, which have got onto the container, and if they established in Australia, would cause quite literally billions of dollars worth of damage. They might be in the actual ship that's bringing the goods, and ballast water and biofouling are examples of that. And what makes all of that challenging for us is that the importer may have no idea at all that the things that they are bringing into the country have the potential to do literally billions of dollars worth of damage. On the other hand, and this is an area where we work very closely with customs, they may deliberately bringing 
something into the country that they know is not allowed, and they're doing it to make a profit. But there's a different view of somebody who's bringing in illegal plant material or illegal foodstuffs from the person who's bringing in narcotics, even though the consequences of that importation could be much worse with the seemingly minor importation of plants. Despite these differences, customs risks and biosecurity risks come into the country in much the same way. They come in as air or sea cargo. They come in with passengers, as mail or on a vessel. And that means that customs officers and my biosecurity officers work in the same environments. You'll see them both at airports and at seaports, at cargo depots and at mail centres. And in many cases, they even look like they're doing the same things. They assess documents, they examine cargo, they use detector dogs and they question passengers. Despite that similarity on the surface, they're actually doing the jobs in a different way and for different purposes. And an example which has come up in discussions earlier in this conference, for example, is that we see the border as just one layer in our protection against these risks. We do a lot of work offshore to ensure that people who are bringing goods into the country understand our conditions, can find out what they need to do, and can get certification from the exporting country which allows free entry into Australia. There's obviously the work that we do at the border, checking that the goods and people are complying with requirements. And we also recognise that the border is just a filter. It's not a complete barrier. And we won't catch everything. So we have post-border work to help control and eradicate pests and diseases that do get in. And the whole point of working in this way is that, and the whole point of us working in a collaborative way with customs is so that we can effectively manage risks while minimising the impact on legi legitimate trade. Um, and for that reason, it's absolutely critical that customs and biosecurity officers complement each other's work, that they don't duplicate each other's activities, and that they minimise their impact on the economy and on legitimate trade. People sometimes suggest it could all be done with, by one agency. I'm not sure if that's right. I think that by spreading yourself too wide, you can sometimes lower your impact. But what is absolutely critical is that we enhance each other's work and we don't um, get in each other's way or provide extra impediments to trade. So today I'm really going to talk about how customs and my department collaborate together. And I'll start by looking at how cargo comes into the country. And because this is an IT conference, I'll talk a bit about how our IT systems interact so that importers and their customs brokers only have to enter information once and it can be used and analysed by the different agencies for their respective purposes. Um, however, I think it's important that, that collaboration doesn't begin and end with IT. In fact, IT solutions by themselves don't really provide the answers. Um, it goes much deeper um, than the way we work. And if I do have the time, I'll talk about some of the daily operational areas and how we work together so that we can get good outcomes for both agencies. The absolute foundations of coordinated border management start with relationships. And Roger Smith from New Zealand Dep Ministry of Primary Industries yesterday talked about the importance of trust. Um, that has to occur at leadership levels and at operational levels. And it's important that the different agencies who are operating in the border space understand 
and respect each other's objectives because it is very, very easy to think that what we're doing is the most important. And I'm sure that I could challenge everyone in the room today to think about discussions they've had with other agencies and the need they've had to put their own interests first. It's human nature, it's the way of politics, but we need to get over that. We have a memorandum of understanding with customs. It's a high level document that talks about how the relationship's supposed to work. It's supported by specific annexes that articulate objectives and how we work together in various areas. We have regular meetings at every level in the organisation, starting with the Chief Executive Officer. I regularly speak to, have lunch with, talk to my colleagues in customs, and it's fortunate that I worked there for a long time, so I know them. But it's relationships that make things work. But I think in the end, the thing that helps us is that we do have a common cause, and that's to protect Australia from harm, whether it's from narcotics or weapons or from foot and mouth disease. So what I'm gonna talk about now is really just some very straightforward examples of where we work together. And I'll start with cargo. When Cargo gets imported into Australia. The importer or their agent, the customs broker, needs to lodge an import declaration. This goes into the customs integrated cargo system. And this is a primary IT system for all the border agency management of imports and for exports. And you know, it largely provides importers and their brokers with a single window to government um, for those import and export terms. In Australia, the importer submits the information by electronic data interface to the integrated cargo system, and that system is then used by customs to manage um, the, the risk assessment and the processing of the imports and the exports. Uh, what's important is that once that import information has gone into the ICS, my department uses that system to profile for biosecurity ri risks and to place or lift restrictions on the movement of cargo as we determine as necessary and to report. And the profiles we run are really a set of criteria which are matched against the data provided by the importer and which is contained in the ICS. And the profiles can be quite complex. They try to match conditions and they're aimed at broad targets such as country, tariff, and depending on the results of those profiles, uh, um, the consignments get um, referred to the DAF import management system. I'll just say a bit about profiles now that we have in the ICS. We have what we call community protection profiles. These are generally tariff-based profiles and they target the commodities that have been imported which are of potential biosecurity concern. And there are two types of community protection profiles. One is a potential risk profile. And we have about 500 of these. And the way these work is the importer or the customs broker is asked a question which helps us assess the risk. If the question um, is answered to indicate that there is no risk or the risk is acceptable, then there's no more interference from us and the goods can come into the country. There are high risk um, referrals or high-risk profiles, um, about 150 of these. These are generally for commodities which we have a significant concern about because of their likelihood to carry pests or diseases. And these are all referred into the DAF import management system for further assessment. We have cargo risk assessment profiles. These are much more like customs profiles. They target entities. It might be suppliers or importers 
or brokers. And we put profiles in place to help drive compliance from the people we deal with. So if some of these profiles are in place, there'll be high levels of inspection until those entities are compliant with our conditions and then they get um, a freer run of goods into the country. We have about 550 of those. We also use these profiles when we are running targeted campaigns. That's when we are specifically looking at certain consignments that are brought in because we believe that somebody is deliberately trying to evade our controls. Somewhat more pro problematic for us are the self-assessed clearance profiles. Self-assessed clearances in Australia are consignments which are valued at less than $1,000, and they don't require a full import declaration. Um, we have about 3,000 profiles which are used to refer low-value consignments to us for further assessment. The problem is here, the profiling occurs on cargo reports which has less consignment detail than do full import declarations. And so we use a free text matching to look on the goods description. Um, and the nature of that profiling means there can be a profile mismatch, which means that we need to do some further assessment before we can determine whether we need to look at the goods in more detail or not. And a really simple example is the goods description might say orange jumper. We have a profile for oranges because of the concern that they might have for bringing in something like citrus canker. So the orange jumper, which is of no concern to us whatsoever, will be referred to us for assessment. And that's an area where we continue to work closely with customs so we can further refine our profiles. Now, when imported goods are referred from customs ICS system to the DAF import management system, um, we have officers who do an assessment on the information that's there so we can determine what is required. So after the risk is assessed, a biosecurity officer will assign what actions are required to manage the risk. Um, we can use our system to notify brokers and importers of any directions and what actions that they may need to take in order to effectively manage the risk. Um, now, and that might be that the goods can be released or they might need to be treated, either heat treated or methobromide treated, or they may need to be inspected. Now, the point of going into that detail there is, as with any country, um, a large volume of imports come in, and we want to ensure that we only intervene with those where there is real value in doing so. And that means that the only, this process means that the only goods that are referred to us for assessment are those where there is potential biosecurity risk and there are plenty of steps along the way where the risk can be assessed and if it's not high, the goods are released. And so the figures in the end that we have is about 18% of all sea cargo consignments that come into Australia are referred to DAF from customs. About 4.9% of ergo consignments, sorry, air cargo consignments, referred to DAF from customs. And of all of those, 65% were subject to a document check alone before being released. Only 13.4% of the lines, cargo lines referred to us from customs underwent any form of inspection, which is less than 2.5% of all cargo. And that's important because, as everyone in this room is aware, we want to minimise the impact on leg legitimate trade and travel. Between 2008 and 2011, the median 
arrival to release time for imported sea cargo, which was referred to DAF, has been reduced by 14%, and in the same period, air cargo referred to us has been reduced in its release time by 84%. And I think that highlights the benefits of close collaboration between the agencies and also um, agencies taking a genuine approach to assessing risk and basing the decisions that they make on whether to intervene with cargo are on real evidence. And this has actually been a challenge for us because of the, the national psyche that I mentioned before about biosecurity. We've had expectations that we would examine everything. Um, I regularly have to appear before our parliament and there is um, one senator in particular who does suggest that we failed because we didn't see something that was invisible. Um, I challenge anyone here to find something that's invisible. Um, so we've significantly reduced our cargo interventions and ensured that the ones we do deal with have the highest value intervention possible. I'd like to mention a couple of exciting opportunities that are occurring with international coordination. And one of these Roger Smith referred to yesterday, which is how we look at the certification produced by an exporting country to satisfy our import conditions. Now, all goods that are imported into Australia have to meet our strict biosecurity conditions. And many goods, in fact, are prohibited unless the importer gets an import permit for the goods beforehand. And in many cases, that requires certification by a competent authority um, as a condition for entry into Australia. And a really simple example of that, if somebody wants to bring their pet dog into Australia, they need to get certification by a competent authority in the exporting country that the dog has been vaccinated and is free of rabies and is free of some other diseases. And we rely very much on that certification to allow the dog into Australia. Now, historically, that certification was provided as a paper document. And as everyone here knows, paper documents are cumbersome and they are susceptible to fraud. And in one case, we had um, a significant proportion of the government certification that was being provided to us was fraudulent. Obviously, it had an impact on us, has an impact on the risks we're trying to manage, and had a significant impact on the people who were bringing goods into the country. So we've been working primarily with New Zealand, but also with the People's Republic of China to develop government-to-government -government electronic certification systems to reduce the risk and presentation of fraudulent documentation and to provide importers with speed and with certainty and all the cost benefits that go with that. An e-cert for imports, as we call it, is an electronic system that enables DAF to receive overseas government generated certificates for food and for agricultural commodities that are being exported to Australia. Um, this provides us with assurance that the documents we're receiving are genuine and it provides the importers with a great deal more certainty that the goods are going to be approved for their import into Australia more quickly. Um, this builds on a system that we've already got in place for exports and um, the um, positive feedback we've had from industry in the six months that it's been operating has been absolutely phenomenal. And the call is for more and more countries to get involved and there's greater enthusiasm for that. Um, the second thing I just mentioned, and the reason I mention it is because 
um, the WCO was actually an inspiration for this, is that we've been working for a number of years with countries in our region on what we call the Australian Fumigation Accreditation Scheme. And this was developed to address the risk associated with ineffective methyl bromide treatments um, that were being performed on commodities coming to Australia. Um, and the process is one by which we work with the agricultural administrations in participating countries and put in place assurance processes in partnership with them so that we know that when goods have been fumigated in Indonesia or in Thailand or the Philippines or India, that it's been done properly, that the government supports it, and the risks associated with those consignments will be managed. Um, we're trying to move on from that now, and we're working with 24 countries to move this bilateral AFAS program into a single multilateral arrangement, which we are calling the International Cargo Cooperative Biosecurity Arrangement. And this is really focusing on um, setting some consistent, mutually recognised and accepted standards for quarantine treatments, methyl bromide, heat treatment, other treatments to manage risk. And as I said, the model that was used for that is the WCO in setting standards. Um, we're, we're hoping to um, finalise this in um, a meeting that's been held in Manila in June, and um, the purpose is really to focus on the challenges that biosecurity agencies have internationally um, in respect to border management. Um, and if it works, and it's been several years in the making, it will mean there'll be the adoption of a coordinated approach to the development of cargo quarantine treatments and initiatives, methodologies, right through the region. I'll close quickly now by saying that in addition to some of these IT and international processes that we've got in place, real coordination and real collaboration comes in the way people work day to day. So it's my officers working at the airport or at the mail centre alongside customs officers. We need to understand each other's businesses so that when we recognise something that's of interest to the other agency, we refer it and they do the same back with us. This means that we don't need to have two officers, one from each agency on each X-ray machine. We each focus on our areas of greatest risk and trust the other agency to refer to us matters that deal with the risks that we're trying to manage. We've been increasing our focus on intelligence and targeting of entities in recent years because we discovered there was significant non-compliance and it's the expertise that Customs has and the contribution that Customs can make on that much more intelligence-led um, focus on illegal activity which is providing significant dividends to us and significantly changing the way our clients behave. We take the line that um, the best way for us to manage risks is to encourage and enforce compliant behaviour and it's through this coordinated, collaborative approach with Customs in Australia that we're getting closer and closer to those goals. Thank you very much. Uh, Suzanne, do we have time for questions? Okay, good. I think uh, we have listened to quite very interesting three speakers from the national perspective. Um, I'll open the floor for questions. Uh, if there anyone, uh, can you please just uh, name yourself, where you're from, and then direct your questions to which speakers? Uh, any, any questions? Anyone? No questions? Tea break is coming. Oh, okay. Pardon? Sir. Excuse me. Excuse me, sir. Excuse me. For Australia, what's the percent of you? Okay. Oh, sorry. What, uh, Dr. Tarwat Watani, Ministry of Environment and Water Development. 
سوري فور ذا بي ان استراليا وذ ذا بيرسون فيش فور ذا ريد مين اند تو انسبكت روتس اند بليز فور بري ديبارشر اند بري ارايفل تريتمنت وذ ذا بروسيجر اند فور ترانزيت اند امبورت اند فور سبيشالي فور ذا ترانزيت اوف كورس نوت ان استراليا اند اذر ان اني اذر كونتري وات وي كان دو فور ذوز ويتش از بويزونز اور A very harmful uh, goods. What we can need as a country for transit. Thank you very much. Anyone wish a team? Yep. Uh, team, you want to take it? Yep. Sorry, I um, I missed. I didn't have the translation. I missed the very first part of the question. But um, what I did get was, how do we put in place controls What's for the transit the of dangerous goods? For the first question, what's the percentage for red main inspection? As a single window red main, I think you have for inspection goods and take uh, samples uh, for laboratories. And uh, there's a yellow. I think also there's a green. In the red main, which uh, these the goods need to inspect directly by laboratory and take test uh, to clearance booths. What the percentage of the selectivity here? Thank you. Uh, um, of of all the goods. That come into the country, um, there's about 13% which are referred to us because of the profiles we have. Um, when they're referred to us, we go through the documents, um, look at the nature of the goods, look at who is involved in the importation, and then make a decision as to whether or not we need to inspect the goods. Um, so the decision on whether or not we inspect the goods is very much risk-based. For some specific commodities, uh, such as imported food, we have um, an inspection regime which is either 5% of consignments or 100% of consignments until good compliance has been demonstrated. So the level of inspections we do isn't um, mandated in most areas, but it is dependent on um, what the risk is and what the compliance history is. So there might be one importer who regularly imports high-risk goods, but because that importer has got an excellent compliance record and always has things as they're supposed to be, we won't inspect them much at all. It'll just be a check every now and again. On the other hand, if an importer is not compliant or they don't have the right certification or they don't have the right permits, then we have much, much higher inspection rates. So the inspection rates we choose to have are very much based on all the factors which lead to our assessment of risk. Okay, thank you. Uh, I think. I think we have just time for one more question, and I saw the hand, uh, gentleman there. Do you, yeah, could you please address? Assalamu alaikum. Yunus Hajri, Wazar al Dakhliya, Qiyad al Amma, the Shark of Sarja. Tabad Awal, Tribidai Ashkar, and the Maluma of Hayba, Raya, the Stefana Kathir, the Tajab in Australia. And this all, Hasatan, the Nishan Arf, the Moan, and the تشهد فيها العديد من الضبايا الواردة فبغينا نعرف ما هي التقنيات المستخدمة للشحنات الواردة إلى أستراليا وما هي نسبة التفتيش الكشف التفتيش على الضبايا الواردة وما هي العقوبات التي تطبق في حالة اكتشاف إلى الواردة ولكم شكرا Okay, I think the question is directed to the team again. Yep. And, and speakers, can you please address? Yeah. First, thank you very much for the question um, and for your comments. As far as the technologies are concerned, um, we do use um, x-rays in airports and in mail centers, and we use detector dogs quite widely with cargo, with airports, and with mail. With other
cargo that comes in the country, there's not much technology which is really useful to determine whether or not a plant is diseased, apart from microscopes and um, all sorts of scientific things which are beyond my knowledge. We have a whole team of vets, of entomologists, of plant pathologists who are involved in the inspection of goods. Um, we'll do physical inspections of um, machinery that comes into the country to ensure that it's clean. We'll do physical inspections of grain to make sure it has no diseases with it or no pests like capra beetle. So it is actually quite um, a specialist skill that needs to be had um, with scientists who are doing these inspections. Um, in terms of penalties, I I'll take a step back first. Um, I tried to make the point in my presentation that we do as much work as we can offshore before the goods even get loaded onto the ship to come to Australia. In our view, the best way we can manage the risk is to make sure it never gets on a ship. And then when, when the vessel arrives, we inspect the goods to make sure it complies with our requirements. Um, if importers are non-compliant, there's a, a very wide range of sanctions. At the first level, we will work with them to educate them. We take the view that um, for people to be compliant, our requirements need to be as simple and straightforward and essential as necessary. So we try not to have unnecessary or difficult bureaucratic procedures. And we're constantly trying to simplify and get rid of those. So if it was ignorance on the importer's behalf, we will work to educate them, explain more, but we will also look at more of their imports in future. If it's an importer who's regularly non-compliant, then um, we will have much more intrusive inspections. And there are two reasons for that. One is because we need to do it to manage the risk, because risk has been identified. But perhaps more importantly, um, it provides a commercial incentive for them to do better. And we do try to differentiate between the people who are really good, who can get their goods through the country faster, and those who aren't so good, who have more hurdles to go over. And in that way, we're trying to encourage better behavior. At the top end of the spectrum, with people who are deliberately non-compliant, um, there are penalties um, up to a million dollars or 10 years in jail. And in the last um, few months, there have been several jail sentences handed down for um, a group of importers who were deliberately importing foodstuffs from Korea at a time when Korea was suffering from foot and mouth disease. So they were bringing in products that at the time were banned, meat products, milk products. Um, although the risk was probably quite low that these products could cause an outbreak of foot and mouth disease, the behavior by the importers was deliberately criminal and the consequences of foot and mouth disease to the Australian economy are estimated to be over $20 billion in the first year. So risk of likelihood might have been quite low, consequences were huge, and as a result of that, um, three jail sentences have been handed down, and there are more to come. Thank you, Jim. I think that uh, this is a very interesting discussion, and I'm sure that there will be many questions, but I think we're running out of time. So I'd like to close this session, and uh, could you show a show of appreciation to the speakers? And thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. big thank you also from my side uh, to this very interesting panel.
I think the interventions have shown that it is possible to cooperate uh, and to collaborate. Uh, you have to agree what you want to do and you have to trust in the other agency. And you have, as Tim has uh, rightly mentioned, to respect that the objectives of the other agencies might be slightly different. Uh, they might have a need for more data, different data, or a different uh, approach. With that, uh, I would like to say that uh, we are slightly delayed, as you might have noticed, um, but our refresh refreshment break uh, will start now. Uh, please come back, if possible, at 11.50, so uh, that we are not too delayed for lunch. And the refreshment break is sponsored by Webfontaine. Uh, may I ask a representative of Webfontaine uh, to the podium? Thank you. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, Webfontaine is delighted to offer you this refreshment and contact break. And while you enjoy it, please, you're welcome to visit our booth on D3, just next door. So enjoy yourself. <laughs>